Welcome to Fiona's Food for Life YouTube channel, Cook, Eat, Nourish. Today, I'm heading back off to Ballymaloo in East Cork in a little village called Shanagari to meet one of the co-founders of the cookery school, Rory O'Connell. I also worked under Rory as head chef in Ballymaloo House for a year after I did the cookery school, back 23 years ago. So I hope you listen to the end and listen to all the wonderful things Rory's talking about, the great books that he's written, running the cookery school, awards, etc. Please like and comment and don't forget to subscribe. Hi Rory, thanks for joining me. I'm delighted, delighted to chat. Great. Yeah. Would you mind introducing yourself to my audience? I will, absolutely. Hello, my name is Rory O'Connell. I'm, I'm a chef, I suppose, really. And at the moment, I'm spending most of my time at the Ballymaloo Cookery School and then I have various other bits and pieces that I do. But I cook for a living. That's me. Great. Would you mind telling me a little bit about your career to date? Yeah, well, I started cooking um, by accident, really. Um, I went to university to study law and then, um, having not sort of done so well at that or not being all that interested in that, I um, did mess around doing a few other things. Anyway, long and the short of it, I ended up in Ballymaloo and at the end of this, that particular summer when I'd been working on reception, I asked Mrs. Allen, if I could go into the kitchen for a few months just to learn how to cook specific dishes rather than to learn how to cook. But within a couple of weeks of um, starting, um, I knew that I wanted to cook. So I cooked at Bani Malou for um, several years and then that sort of set into a restaurant we had in Paris called La Ferme Irlandaise, which was um, a restaurant we opened to a showcase Irish, Irish produce in France. So I spent some time there. And then when I came back to um, Ireland, um, having been in Paris, and um, would be backwards and forwards, um, then um, at some point or other around then, Darina, um, or no, sorry, I'm forgetting myself. At, when I finished in Ballyboo, my sort of first phase in Ballyboo, I went to work in a restaurant in Cork called Arbutus Lodge, yes. which was really important uh, for all sorts of different reasons. It was just a fantastically good restaurant. Style of cooking was somewhat different to what we were doing at Ballymaloo. Uh, the kitchen was run on much more formal sort of French lines. And I had the good fortune when I was there to cook with really two fantastic chefs, um, Michel Flam and uh, also Michael Clifford, the late Michael Clifford. Um, so that was a really fantastic experience. And at the end of my year there, um, that was when Darina suggested, said to me, she was thinking of opening a cookery school and she asked me would I like to be involved with her? And I said I would. So that was around the time the cookery school started. Then I was very involved in the school, but while I was working in the school, I would, I would go back to Ballymaloo on a f to cook the main course mm -hmm. on a Thursday and a Friday evening. So that was a really very busy period of my life. And also then, at that time, the school would close down during the summer. So I would go, for example, one summer I went and spent three months working at Shane Eco, which was a two star two Michelin star restaurant in London, went on to get a third star, and then I cooked with Raymond Blanc, so it was all that sort of thing going on. And then, um, and then I, much, much later, I came back to Ballymaloo as head chef, where I spent 10 years. There was a time where Mrs. Allen was running the Euro talk with the European uh, Union Organization of Chefs, so, um, and Mrs. Allen gave, gave me a free hand in the kitchen, so I ran the kitchen for 10 years. I was one of your chefs for a year there. That's yeah. right, yes, yes, that was a great period. It was very busy, uh, business was really good. I think we achieved terrific consistency and really lovely quality, I was very happy. But then uh, after about 10 years, I, I, I wanted time for myself, not to stop working, but to do other things. I'd always wanted to write a book, a cookery book, and I didn't have time to do that when I was around the kitchen in Ballymaloo because it was all en engrossing. And the thing about a restaurant like Ballymaloo is because it's a hotel, that it's not just lunch and dinner, it's breakfast. It's mm. the first cup of coffee until the last patty of four. And possibly then it's thinking about a picnic. You know, that's to leave at six o'clock in the morning, it's all that sort of thing. So it was a very wide and busy thing, but I love doing it. Um, so then, uh, anyway, I, um, I left Ballymaloo and I went traveling actually, which has nothing to do with my career, but in a way it was quite important because I sort of missed the stage where I might have gone traveling as a younger person. Yes, yeah. okay. So anyway, I did all of that and that was fun. And during that time, actually, I went and worked in Chez Panisse in Berkeley, California. Um, so that was quite a good thing to do. Um, and then, you know, eventually I got a book, I got a book deal, um, and I hit, came back to teaching at the school a little bit then. I'm much more involved now again. 
Um, and at some point or other, I was asked to do TV, and that happened. So in a few weeks' time, hopefully, he's God, I'm going to record my sixth uh, series. Wow. Yeah. So now, what I do now is a lovely sort of mixed bag. I always say to like, the students here at school that my job is the perfect job. For most of my cooking, I stand in one spot and everything is handled to me. <laughs> and then when I make, then everything is taken away from me. It's kind Great. of, it's a joyful <laughs> way to cook. But it allows me the time to be, you know, uh, you know, to think about, I'm doing another book as well at the moment. You know, to, you need time, at least I certainly need time to think about those things. Um, and my career at the moment allows me to do that. Okay. So a couple of things you probably brushed over there, award-winning books, is that right? Yes, the first book, Master It, uh, which nearly broke me, um, I was lucky enough to work with um, Fourth Estate of the Publishers, and um, particularly with a woman called Louise Haynes, she was the commissioning editor, and um, she um, is hugely respected, for example, she does all of Nigel Slater's books, he's one of our authors. So I was lucky to work with her, and then that book won the uh, Andre Simon Award, um, which was I was thrilled with a really prestigious uh, English yeah. award. And then the second book, Cook Well, Eat Well, which was published in Dublin by Gill Books, uh, won the Irish Cookbook of the Year Award that particular year. Fantastic. So, well done. That's quite nice, I suppose. <laughs> and brilliant. And did you win Chef of the Year twice as well? I won Chef of the Year. I won, yes, I did. Um, I can't remember when. It's not it's when I was, while I was working in Ballymaloo. I won uh, Chef of the Year and also I won Chef Outside of Dublin of the Year. Okay. So that's kind of odd to say that. <laughs> yeah. Great, well done. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm talking to Darina about, one of my things are to, to get people to cook from scratch. Yeah, sure. What can we do, and I know it's one of the things you're passionate about as well, but what can we do to, to get it involved in the curriculum and, and to teach people how to cook? Well, you have to convince the people who make the laws that this is going to be worthwhile and it's going to benefit everybody and that there may be a positive financial implication. That's one of the, that, that yeah. from my understanding of the way politics works. The financial implication is easy to enough, I think, to work out actually. I mean the social implications are so obvious, it's like the you know, the nose on your head, um, of people eating at home, the the community is can engender in the home in a way that there might not be in some homes nowadays. Um, it makes people think about their lives a bit differently, you know, in terms of people are, are so busy nowadays. So if, you, if people are going to decide to cook at home, um, and if that's going to be, say, part of a government policy, well, then people have got to be allowed, given a little bit of time to do the cooking at home. Mm, it just doesn't happen, true. just yeah. like that, you yeah. know. So, um, uh, so there's, there's the social aspect, but the financial aspect is that over a period of time, it should improve the health of the nation. Mm. If it improves the health of the nation, it brings down the health, food costs, health costs. Yeah. And that is something that might interest some of the departments in the government. Yes. And from a primary or secondary school in the education department, what can we do there, do you think? Well, I mean, you, you meet, we regularly meet some fantastic uh, domestic science teachers who would love, many of them, if there was proper cooking facilities in schools again. I mean, if parents will need to demand it, otherwise okay. it isn't going to happen. It's as simple as that. Parents will need to demand it. And for parents to demand it, they need to see the benefits for their children and for their, and for their families. And I think the benefits of cooking at home, you know, any sort of food move, as far as we can see, the most, the, the first step in terms of really good health and all the rest of it is knowing how to cook yourself. Mm -hmm. Because until you know how to cook yourself, you cannot cura, curate your own diet properly. Yeah. You're relying on other people to make those decisions for you. And if you can cook yourself, it means you can then you, you take that vested interest in the shopping for the ingredients and, as I say, sort of curating it. So that's just crucial. Just that's okay. crucial. Okay. Well, hopefully in the next few years we'll see it becoming yes. yeah, a, a bit more yeah. mainstream. Yes. Uh, Rory, one of the things I loved, and I think you were heavily involved in it, was LitFest. That's right. It was a great time. Is it yes. coming back? Uh, it's not coming back, I'm afraid. Yeah, LitFest was great. It first was Doreena's idea, and then I ran it, basically. <laughs> She's got the ideas in the address book, and then I've got a certain amount of organisational skills. Yeah, that was a really fantastic event. Um, I'm very proud of what we achieved over the period of time that we did it. Um, and maybe, sorry, for some of my audience might know exactly what it is. Yes. Do you want well, to describe? Yes. yes, it started off as um, a food and drinks um, literary festival, specifically about authors. So in the first two years, you had to be somebody who wrote and who had been published 
on the subject of food and drink. Okay. Yeah, and that could have been non-alcoholic drink as well as alcoholic drink. And then I decided, because it was quite interesting, because as the festival evolved, it became a bit more political, a bit more topical, rather than talking about beautiful books. We started to talk about, obviously, what was in the beautiful books, but also, you know, you can't look at or talk about food and drinks nowadays and not talk about the environment and not talk about the politics and not talk about the economics. So we loosened it from a festival dedicated to food and to, to a literary festival dedicated to food and drink to becoming a festival dedicated to food and drinks literacy. And the food and drinks literacy was about people knowing about what was in the food they were eating and the drinks they were drinking. So um, and we had unbelievable um, names and people here we were so honoured, you know. Uh, René Redzapi, Claudia Roden, um, Jochen Mottolenghi, uh, Alice Waters, you know, it just went on and on. Every year after year, it was fantastic. Um, and it was great, and I think it was really worth, really worthwhile. Some fantastic conversations were had, and I think, I, I think things happened as a result of it. Um, but then after five years, we decided just to take a little break and a breather. Uh, and, um, and we're still breathing <laughs> and breaking. <Yay. laughs> I knows? lost it like such a great weekend. It, yeah, was, it yeah. was so good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really, I, I must say, uh, it's not, I don't blow my own trumpet, but um, I think of its type, it was a fantastic event. Yeah. Really, yeah. Uh, and uh, we felt it was very inclusive. Um, a, a lot of the events you had know, to pay for a ticket, but there were so many free events uh, of, uh, you know, of really unbelievable quality. So, you yeah, know, something I am proud of, I must say. Yeah, oh, it was brilliant. If you ever think of bringing it back, let me know. I'll be Thank there. You. <laughs> It'll be on the committee. <laughs> um, so, Rory, one of the things that I understand you did when the Web Summit first started up in Dublin, you were looking after, you were in charge of the food for all of the delegates. That, that that's right, I was. Um, massive project. It, it, it was absolutely huge project. Well, it, 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 it started off as being massive, then it just became this sort of bell moth. But anyway, um, I was asked by Margaret Jaffers of Good Food Ireland who had been tasked by um, Paddy Cosgrove um, you know, to look after, to do the food. Uh, that was the lunches um, for the delegates on the day of the event and some dinners in the evening. So I, I, I was asked to do that. I think the first year was maybe 5,000 people, but then it became 15,000 people a day and stuff, and it was like unbelievable. So again, I, I, I mean, I think it was successful, uh, you know, and it was amazing actually because it brought together all of the members of this organisation called Good Food Ireland, so producers, restaurateurs, chefs, cafe owners, everybody brought them all together in kind of an extraordinary way, and they were unbelievable, really unbelievable, uh, to put the, you know to put the best foot forward for Ireland. It was really great. And how long did it take you to? So it ran over a few days. It ran over the first year. I think it was two days. What's the second year? Three days. I, I blurred some of it out okay. actually. Yeah, <laughs> I blurred some of it out. But uh, there was a lot of organisation involved. I mean, you know, months. And then obviously closer to the time it became a sort of a full-time thing. Yeah. But basically it was about making lists and and then and then sub lists and sub sub lists <laughs> and crossing things off and and being willing to change a plan if somebody dropped out or whatever. But it's basically any kind of organization in the way I do it is about lists. Yeah. And were you just totally exhausted afterwards? I was absolutely shattered, somewhat elated, but completely shattered. And I think collectively, in terms of the, the years I was involved in Web, Web Summit, I think it's taken a year off my life about that. Yeah, it was phenomenal, yeah. Because I remember the biggest event I ever had to manage was um, a Citibank Christmas party in Australia for 2,000 people. Yeah, and I think I yeah. slept for three days after. Yeah, I was just yeah, exhausted. Yeah, yeah. It and is, I can't imagine. It is, yeah. I mean, it's a really great team, you know, and um, and then at some point, you you know, I, I, was, I, couldn't, I wasn't going to be able to get every one of the 15,000 people to make sure they got precisely what they wanted and and you know uh, and, and you can only get to meet as many people and 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 glean the knowledge that they have had a good time from that small amount of people you meet but overall the feeling was i think very very positive well done yeah, well done yeah. so what's what's next for Rory O'Connor? so uh another tv series this year hopefully which is great and i hope this year um, that we're going to do uh, the series, I want to focus on vegetables, which sounds like a knee-jerk reaction to what we've always eaten and, as you know, grown vegetables here and, and love them. But I want to focus each program on a particular vegetable because I want to go okay. and meet the producers, which everybody has done. But then within, if I'm doing a program about carrots, well, there'll be, there might be chicken in there, there might be beef in there, you know, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. But um, I think it's a very, I think the timing is, the timing is quite obviously right for that. So that's the problem. So I'm looking forward to that. 
and then I'm writing, I'm writing another book, uh, which the copy is supposed to be in in about eight weeks time. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> and are you tell, will that tell us what the book is about or anything? Um, the book, you know, it's just again, it's sort of general um, recipes that you know the sort of food that I like to cook, which. Um, I mean, I because I don't differentiate really between um, what I eat at home on my own or just have a quite supper at home do this, and then if I have people for dinner, I don't see any yeah. difference. I mean, if people some evening come one evening and and, and I've really today's eggs from here, well, we might have boiled eggs, and I think that's just good enough actually when they're superb. So it's going to be more complicated than boiled eggs, but it's it's the sort of food I love to cook at home, and it's it's timely. I think it's. Uh, introducing some new flavours and I, I like as much as possible that all of the recipes are, are you know pretty original that's really okay. that's all of my approach um, and not everything is original and very little is original anymore but at least um, that it's, it's got a fresh feel to it and that's full of new ideas okay look forward to that that's the plan so Rory I always ask the people I'm interviewing can they give us three tips that will help improve the health of the nation or three things that they can work on now? so Rory what are your three tips well, definitely people learning how to cook, as we spoke about earlier on, because you have complete control, because it kind of goes back to the company, the boiled egg conversation we had a moment ago. If you buy a really good egg, you know, if you're a perfectly organic egg, and you know how to cook it yourself to make a hard boiled egg or a soft boiled egg, and, and you know, you have some good bread or make your own bread, how do you just go with it? You've got boiled glass food, and you're in control. Yeah. And then obviously you want to stew, or, you know, for example, I think even nowadays learning how to cook, if someone makes a conscious decision that they want to be vegan, for example, well, I would not want to be vegan and not being able to cook. I would oh, yeah. not want other people cooking my food for me. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there are some wonderful people who cook vegan, but, but generally speaking, if I was relying on what I could buy, I'd be a bit worried. Yeah. So learning how to cook is crucial for all of the different reasons, and I think it's got huge benefits, not just, you know, the, the food that, that we would eat as a result, people would eat as a result, but just, you know, the smell of food cooking in a house. I mean, the smell of a loaf of bread or a smell of a cake being cooked or a stew bubbling is just it's kind of priceless yeah you know it really is and a sense of achievement as well when you sit down and you've you've all, done it you can see that they can all of that. start cooking yeah. it's like wow, yeah, all, all of that and once people learn to cook then they'll know how how to waste less food mm -hmm. they'll know about they understand about buying directly the price of food so it's such a part of the whole uh, sustainable thing and speaking of sustainability my second thing will be shopping locally and seasonally okay it's such a cliche um, and you know, people, everybody's been saying it for years and years, but a, just a real proper focus. For example, one of the new cakes that I'm putting into my book is a raspberry cake, and there's some marshmallow, and I'm not going to give, give the whole thing away. But I've, 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 I've used unapologetically frozen raspberries in that cake. So they're raspberries that I picked myself or I bought locally or got from here last uh, July or August when they're at their best and when they're at their cheapest, mm -hmm. and I froze them. So I'm preserving them if you want to use yeah. the fancy words, you know, yeah. So, and I'm putting those in my cake rather than, now this time of the year, rather than uh, a raspberries that come from Peru or Chile or something like that, you know. So um, that goes back to you know, the whole shopping locally. And, and generally speaking, you know, you know, if the food is local, it's traveled a shorter distance, hopefully it'll have more nutritional value. As a result of that, it's keeping the local economy going. I mean, the countryside, a lot of country towns and villages are in a state of chassis because of the way businesses move from countries to, to, to much bigger towns and cities, so anything we can do to generate um, more ways for farmers and growers to make an income in, in time is going to help everybody. So that's the, that's the second thing. And then the third thing then is to think about the way your grandmother cooked. And now I'm not saying you cook exactly the way your grandmother cooked, but just think again, she cooks absolutely locally. And seasonally, I mean, there's no. I mean, the notion that you've got <laughs> a raspberry in, you know, in January. I mean, that you know, just simply out of the question. Of course, we can expand that now, and there's no no doubt about it that having a, a wide diet and a varied diet is definitely very good. But um, if you take a, a lot of the elements of what your grandmother might have cooked and the nourishment that was in a lot of that food, uh, I think you would be doing quite well with that. Okay, great tips. And going back briefly to your local and seasonal, yeah. in your current book, The Cook Well, Eat yes, Well, yeah. um, I love the way that you have that laid out. So you yes, have yeah. that laid out per season. Oh, very much, yeah. And yeah. then it's also per entertaining, or as you say, almost what you would do yourself 
anyway. Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. In, in different menus yes, and things. Yes, so, so, the, so the four seasons and then with each season there's six or is it six balanced meals. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And that thing. Uh, but for anybody who's thinking about writing a cookbook, I tell you, it's a difficult way to lay out a cookbook because it becomes like a game of sort of chess in a way. Uh, you know, because, uh, but anyway, it, it, it makes it more difficult than just having a list of starters, okay. main uh, courses, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. but I think for, for the user, if someone's saying, okay, well, like, what is in season in Ireland at yes, yeah. a certain time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, in your book, it, yeah. it lays it all yes. out yeah. really well. Yeah, of course, the whole thing now about, about writing books uh, about seasonality, I mean, the seasons are without changing, without that changing. And some of the ingredients are coming in earlier and stuff like that. So just if you think I got it wrong, maybe it's good. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Um, Rory, one of the questions I love to ask is what would you choose as your last meal? Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> Such a difficult question in many ways because particularly when you're asking me in a place like this here at Bally Cook School where there's this incredible farm and this just marvellous, magical food doesn't arrive into our lap, but it's created here. Both by the farmers and the gardeners outside, and also local producers who, who we deal with and have dealt with for many years. Um, so, um, um, so that's it, it makes the question quite difficult because sometimes actually a boiled egg can seem to me like the most extraordinary thing. But we'll splat out a little bit if you give the point because I'm going to say wild Irish salmon. Lovely. Uh, which of course is so scarce. When I started cooking, um, you remember when you were cooking with mm. me in Ballymun House, yeah. you know, the, the salmon, you know, which is there was, so, there was so much of it there. Now it's very rare, so we get a, little, a few salmon from the black water every year. And I poached that, and so I would hollandaise made from our own eggs and our own butter. And then I would have some ideally asparagus with that. Beautiful. And that would be heaven and a delicious bottle of wine. That's what I was going to ask, a wine? But, okay, uh, red or white? Yes, or white with that. White. But then I'd have a glass of red afterwards, I love red wine. <laughs> Which you ask me, what are you going to do? <laughs> are you going to have dessert or cheese or anything after that? Um, I'm going to have dessert, but at that time of the year, um, I might, the, might, the gooseberries might be in. So if, if, which I think they could be just depending on the year. So it would be those hard, hard green gooseberries poached with elderflower, um, just a compote of those, and then probably curry bean moss pudding, or else something like a praline ice cream. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Lovely, fantastic. <laughs> Good. How can my audience get in touch if they would like to get in touch with you? Um, you can contact the cookery school here um, at cookingisfun.ie or you can ring the cookery school here at 053532146467385 four, and they'll put you in contact with me. Brilliant. And I have yeah. to bring you a, a little thank you. Oh, you did. Well, you did, in fact, but thank you. Um, well, I don't you. know if it meets the, the standards. No, so that's a homemade kimchi. Oh, fabulous. Just that's ready lovely, to get yeah. on the fridge. It's been going for three yeah, days, so it's gorgeous. ready to go. Yeah, lovely. And these are always in my goodie bag. So it's a raw power bar. So lovely. it's full of nuts and seeds banged together with um, raw Irish honey and cacao butter, and I make the chocolate that goes on. Yeah, wow, that's very impressive. Thank so you so thank much. So thank you very much. Not Thanks, sir. Thank, so thank, you. thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's video with Rory O'Connell. Please check out my other videos, like perhaps the interview I did with Dorina Allen, or like Rory always says to eat in season, I have a monthly seasonal video, check out March's video. Thanks for watching. Please like and comment below and don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.